Welcome back as we continue our Fox Sports 2022 USFL coaching series with New Orleans Breakers head coach, Larry Fedora. I talked with Coach Fedora about his background, being a wide receiver coach at a triple option school and really working to make sure the quarterback actually throws the ball in that scheme is fascinating. I talk a little bit with Coach Fedora about some players that he is excited about that quite honestly, you're excited about, TJ Logan, Johnny Dixon, Jay Adams and the like. And we get into how his staff came together and even more interesting is just what the next 28 days for him were going to look like as they got started with training camp on March 25th. All right, let's talk to Coach Fedora. Welcome back to our Fox Sports 2022 USFL coaching series. And I have before me today, New Orleans Breakers head coach, Larry Fedora. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm good, sir. I'm going to start off, uh, off the rip by saying my mother is going to watch this one pretty closely. She's a Southern Miss alum, and she appreciates right. what you were able to do for the Golden Eagles. All right. To the top. Tell her I said hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you've been a head coach at the Group of Five and Power Five level. We'll get into some of that. But why did you want this opportunity to coach in the USFL? Yeah, to, to, to have the opportunity to be, uh, to be on the ground floor of a uh, professional football league, I mean, was uh, was just too hard to pass up. I mean, you know, to be able to coach some players that are hungry and excited about uh, playing football and being in this new league, it was, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity in my opinion. Well, Coach, I'm excited about what your staff looks like. One of the things that happened just the day before we started taping this is the introduction of the coaching staffs, and I was going up and down it. There are guys that have won Super Bowls on staffs. There are all pros on staff. What can you tell us you were excited about with your assistant coaching staff? Yeah, to start off with uh, both my coordinators, uh, John Tenuta, the defense coordinator, who's been coaching, you know, close to 40 years at the collegiate level, has been a defensive coordinator all over the country, very well respected, uh, has seen it all, and, and uh, he's excited about coaching, you know, in this league. And then you got Noel Mazzoni, who's another guy that uh, – and I've, neither, I've never worked with either one of these guys, but I've known them, respected them. Uh, watched them, you know, uh, all, you know, throughout my 35 years of collegiate coaching. And so uh, you got Noel Mazzoni, who's been all over the place himself, who's, uh, you know, that he and I go way back to when we very first started these one back offenses and uh, going spread and no huddle all the way back into the uh, 90s. And so, you know, I, I'm just uh, excited about working with a bunch of guys. Paul Spicer, who's, who's played in the NFL, has been in Super Bowls. Uh, Jim Turner, our old line coach, who's who's uh, coached all over the country and and been in the league, uh, you know. So we got a bunch of great guys on this staff that I'm excited about. One of the things I'm always curious about, Coach, is when you tell us stuff like you hadn't worked with either one of those coordinators before. How do you approach them? Is it a phone call about, hey, I'm doing this. Do you want in? How do you recruit guys to your staff? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, started out, I mean, from scratch was, uh, you know, identifying guys that I felt good about, you know, and then getting on the phone with uh, with each one of them and, and talking about the league and what the league was going to do and how we were going to do things and just hear the excitement in their voice about being part of something on the ground floor. You know, I mean, it's not every day that you put an entire team together from scratch. You know, usually you go into a situation and you got players already there and, and, and you and, uh, you know, put your culture and start creating your culture with this thing. We're starting it from the beginning. I mean, we're, we're we picked the very first player of this team, you know, all the way to number 45. And so now it's taking all those men and molding them together into being the, the best team that we can possibly be and winning a championship. I want to take it back just a little bit, Coach, uh, because I became familiar with you when you had a stint at Oklahoma State. But I wonder if you could tell USFL fans what your offensive and defensive philosophy are going to look like. I mean, you mentioned one back offenses, and that seems to be a staple of what you do. What else could you tell us about that? Well, you know, when we started talking, uh, you know, actually when Nolan and I started talking about this, it was like, uh, okay, so. Uh, you know, let's talk about the basics, a huddle. And I was like, well, I haven't been in a huddle since 1996. You know, I, I really haven't. I mean, other than a, a short yardage or a goal line situation, I mean, I, I didn't even know how to put a huddle together, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, that's going to be interesting. You know, we, we will, you know, we're going to be under center. We'll be in the gun. 
Uh, we'll, we'll be able to go no huddle. We'll also be able to be in a huddle. Uh, you know, so we want to be able to bounce in and out of multiple things and, and try to keep the defense off uh, off balance. Defensively, go ahead, RJ. No, we, I was going to ask defensively. I'm sorry. Yeah, defensively, I mean, we want to be, you know, an aggressive, get to the quarterback guy. Uh, we want to we want to harass that quarterback. We want to fly to the ball. You got to stop the run. I don't care what league you're in. You have to be able to stop the run. You got to try to make a team one dimensional. And then when you do, you got to get after that quarterback. And so I think I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I know John and the way John likes to blitz and the way he likes to, uh, you know, adjust things throughout a game that uh, we should be an exciting style of defense. Dictating terms on both sides of the ball is what it sounds like to me, coach. I'm excited about that. I want to take it a little bit further back in your career, though. You mentioned having not been in a huddle since 1996. I'm under the impression, and please disabuse me if this is wrong, that as wide receiver coach at Air Force, you convinced Fisher DeBerry to throw the football? Well, I tell you what, I worked hard on that, and we were really <laughs> good those years. I, I did. I mean, now we might have thrown it about uh, maybe 14 times a game, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I can re- vividly remember talking to Coach DeBerry. I was like, Coach, we're getting one coverage. I mean, we got to take advantage of this. We got to throw the ball more. And, he, and, he, and I remember him saying, Larry, we are throwing the ball. We're just throwing it like this. We're we're, pitch, we're throwing it backwards, you know, on the pitch. So, uh, but I tell you what, that was a wonder, unbelievable experience working for Fisher DeBerry at the Air Force Academy. It's one of the real cool stories, I think, Coach, about your journey is just where you have been. One of the other places you started, quite honestly, college football, playing yourself. Which coach would you say you've learned the most from going back to winning a national title at Austin College? I believe as a wide receiver. Yeah, so uh, that was at Austin College, a, a small, very, very small private school in the state of Texas. Uh, Larry Kramer was our head coach at the time, and, and uh, you know, a big factor of why I wanted to be a football coach, you know, because of the, the influence that he had on me. But, you know, for me, I would, I would have to say it would be people like him, every, every coach, every assistant coach that invested in my life uh, throughout my time as a player and, and uh you know, then you get into coaching and, and a guy named Scott Smith, who gave me my first job, uh, uh, Grant Taft, who was the head coach at Baylor for many, many, many years and is a Hall of Fame coach, Fisher DeBerry at the Air Force Academy, Chuck Reedy, uh, I mean, Andy McCollum, Ron Zook, uh, Mike Gundy, all these guys that I worked for definitely had an impact on me as a football coach. And it seems to be paying dividends, coach, everywhere you go you end up winning something somewhere. But I also wonder how familiar you are with at least two of the coaches in this league. I've been having fun talking with Coach Sumlin, who coaches the Houston Gamblers, Coach Holtz, who coaches the Birmingham Stallions, and, of course, you coach the New Orleans Breakers. But, you know, there's this game in 2011, conference championship on the line, your Southern Miss Golden Eagles going against his Houston Cougars. How did that end up going for you, Coach? It went pretty good for us. I mean, uh, I, I'll give Sumlin a lot of credit. They were an incredible football team. I think they were in the you know top five or top six in the country at the time. They were undefeated. They had the number one offense in the league. Case Keenum was their quarterback. Uh, they were scoring over fifty points a game. I mean, it was uh, it was a heck of a contest. But uh, our guys played extremely well, and we we were a good football team, you know. And uh, we were we we deserved to win the conference championship, and we outplayed them that day, you know. And uh, you know. Kevin and I talk about that quite a bit, actually. So, uh, but uh, I have a lot of respect for Kevin, a lot of respect for Skip, and all the coaches in this league. I mean, there's some dang good football coaches in this league. Yeah, coach, and I'm really excited about both of you having lived and still live in the state of Oklahoma, where both of you men have passed through as assistant coaches. You, of course, Oklahoma State, and him at Oklahoma. You took Kyle Slaughter with the Breakers' first pick in the inaugural USFL draft. He actually flipped commitment from Tulane to USM shortly after you accepted the job at UNC. I wonder, had you met him before February 22nd? What did you know about it? Yeah, I, I had not met Kyle, uh, but I did. I was aware of Kyle. I knew that he went into Southern Miss after I left. And uh, because some, you know, a lot of the players that were there that I left there, they became friends with him and, he, you know, they, they were teammates with him. My son was actually on the team while he was there. So uh, I had that familiarity with him and then watched him as he, you know, has done a great job since he's gotten out of, uh, you know, Colorado. I mean, uh, the, out of college 
and uh, you know, just watch what he's done. And he's, you know, he's the type of quarterback we wanted. He can, he's, he's a, a big guy that can throw the ball, but he's very athletic. He can run. He's uh, he's a guy that processes very, very quickly. And that is uh, so important in what we want to do on offense. In the second round for quarterbacks, you took Tulsa alumnus Zach Smith from my alma mater. So I got to ask, Coach, you're going to have a nice little QB derby going on over there. Well, you know, you, you know, Zach won a championship while he was there at Tulsa. And to, to I mean, first of all, I saw him on film, big, strong arm guy, can make every single throw. And he's got a big, big arm, you know, and then to talk to all his coaches that were there at Tulsa while he was there and actually some of the teammates talked about what a leader he was, how hard he worked. Uh, his will to win, you know, uh, that, you know, he, they just said he would, you know, he would put the team on his back and will him to win. And that's why they won a championship that year. So anytime you can get a guy that has that kind of competitiveness and will to win, you got to have him on your team. I appreciate you saying so coach. Uh, another guy that you are very familiar with, I think, and I'm excited to see playing your offense quite honestly is TJ Logan, who was outstanding coming out of high school. When you saw him there in the supplemental draft, I believe you took him in the fourth round. What did you know about TJ, even going back to his high school days when you recruited him to UNC? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I was in Chapel Hill. He was over there in Greensboro, and he was a legend in the state. I mean, he was uh, as big a recruit as there ever was in that state. I mean, a guy, you know, like when he went to the comp combine, he ran a 4-3-8. I mean, he uh, re returned multiple kickoffs for us for touchdowns. He scored a lot of touchdowns from the running back position. You could move him out and he could catch balls from the receiver position. Just a very, very skilled guy, uh, you know, and uh, I was very fortunate to coach him for there four years. He went on to the league and uh, had a lot of injuries ever since he got into the NFL and never has really had his chance to, to shine. And so, I think this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of his skill set. He can help us win a lot of football games. It's a 3,000 yard rusher in high school for those of y'all that don't know. Uh, TJ was that guy coming out of high school. A, a man that actually made a name for himself in college. Another tailback you took, Larry Rose, coming out of New Mexico State, 1,600 yard rusher, Sun Belt Offensive Player of the Year, an AP All American. It feels like between those two guys, you might have one of the best stable of tailbacks in this league. How did you come to find Larry Rose? You know, and I, I didn't know anything about Larry Rose until I started evaluating players that were going to be available in this draft. And I started looking at Larry and, and uh, from New Mexico State and, and started looking at all his skill set and what he was able to accomplish, what he can do, watched a lot of film on him, started talking to people, found out he's from Fairfield, Texas, a little bitty town. He, he says he's from Houston, but he's from a little bitty town. Uh, not far. And my brother was a head high school coach in the state of Texas and played against Larry. And so he started telling me about this kid. And so, you know, he's a grown man now, but uh, when I found out about his personality and, and his smile and his, his competitiveness and his skill set, you know, it was a no brainer for me. Goodness me. I'm going to move to the wideouts coach. Cause it's, there's talent all over this roster. Uh, I think former Arkansas state wideout, Jonathan Adams, could be one of the best receivers in this league. He was a monster in 2020, 79 catches for over 1,100 yards. Between he and Johnny Dixon, former Ohio State wide receiver, it feels like you have a great blend of size and speed. What did you like about those guys? Are they going to end up out on the numbers for you, and what do you expect from them? Well, first of all, I want to give credit that uh, Pat Washington, our receiver coach, did a tremendous job evaluating all the receivers in the draft. You know, now – Jay or Jonathan, he goes by Jay. He was at Arkansas State. Blake Anderson, the head coach at Arkansas State during his time, was my offensive coordinator at, at UNC and at Southern Miss. And so I called Blake and he was like, he's like, dude, if you can get Jay Adams, you need to get him. He's a freak. You know, he's got a 40 inch vertical. He's a 11 foot broad jumper and all these different things. And so, you know, we, uh, I mean, we put him at one of the top receivers at our list and we were able to get him, you know, and so I'm excited about him. Johnny Dixon. I mean, everybody knows what Johnny Dixon did at Ohio State. He's another one. Unbelievable skilled 4-3 guy. I mean, you know, his just as he got into the NFL, ran into a lot of energies. I mean, uh, injuries. And so that's kept him from being the guy he is. He's healthy now. He's excited. He can't wait to get on the field. And so, you know, not only those two guys, we got three other wide receivers that I feel pretty good about, too. Hey, Coach, I'm excited about it. I remember watching uh, Jay Adams in particular go against Kansas State in 2020, and 
He was playing like his hair was on fire. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, players that I asked another coach about, like when well, I'm going to give you a question a little bit later on, so it's a precursor about who are you most having to prepare for? And defensively, uh, per- Pittsburgh, excuse me, Pittsburgh Maulers head coach Kirby Wilson told me that Sharif Miller was a guy that he had already circled. And when you went and got him, he's going, oh, goodness, now we have to prepare for him as opposed to having him on our team. What did you see from that edge man? Yeah, Sharif, I mean, you know, you know, Penn, played at Penn State. I mean, I, I can't remember the amount of sacks he had while he was there. But, I mean, when you turned on the film, it was like – it was a wow moment. You know, it was like watch his get off, how quick he's on the tackle. Not only can he speed rush, he's got power. You know, and, uh, you know, so we were so excited to be able to to have him on our football team. I mean, we I think we really did well on the defensive line. And I think that's going to be the key to this league is being able to stop the run and get to that quarterback. Now, Coach, uh, I think I got it right here. Six foot four, 260 at Penn State, double digit tackets for loss over two seasons at State College. It was a fourth round selection by the Eagles in the NFL draft 2019 you got a killer coach. Uh, I'm excited, yeah. excited to see him play ball. All right. We have three questions that we give to each one of the coaches. So I'm not singling you out, but to your best of your knowledge and ability, please uh, try to answer them. Who is the best offensive player, not in the league, or excuse me, not in the league that does not play for the breakers. So who is the best offensive player in the league that does not play for the breakers? Wow. That's, that's uh well, that's going to be tough. Now, I mean, there's a there's a lot of good players in this league, you know. I, I think uh, when you start looking at the eight quarterbacks that are out there alone, I mean, uh, you know, one that stood out to me uh, when watching film and seeing what he's done is Jordan Tamu. You know, I mean, that I, I, I kid's got uh, he's got everything. He can throw it. You know, he processes. He can run. All those things. So, uh, you know, he's got to be up there. You got. Uh, you got Mike Weber, the running back from Ohio State, you know, that uh, that's in the league. I mean, they're, they're, that's going to be hard for me to pick out one guy. They're, I mean, I, I think uh, the fans are going to have something to uh, watch every Saturday and Sunday this spring that will be exciting. I'm excited to see those two in particular, too, Coach. Uh, of course, Jordan Tamu was the first pick for the Tampa Bay Bandits, who is head coach by Todd Haley. By the way, yeah. that is your rival in this league. I believe what they're calling it is – the Breaker Bay Brawl. First, how cool is that? And second, who do you think is your biggest challenge in the USFL from a team perspective? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know we got a rival already. You know, I, I you know, I mean, this thing started from scratch. So how do you know? You know, but uh, you know, it, that will be fun. That will be fun figuring all those things out. Who, uh, who are we worried about in the league? I, you know, I'm worried about us. You know, I'm worried about us as a coaching staff, blending these, these guys together, uh, you know, molding them into a championship team. That's all I'm worried about right now. I don't know who else. I don't even know who else is out there. Well, I'm just concerned about us. The last question I have in this ilk for you, coach, is on the defensive side, who is the player that you think you have to game plan for the most, not on the New Orleans Breakers? Oh, gosh. That's a tough, again, you're asking me some tough questions. I mean, we hadn't played a game yet. Maybe it's somebody that was on your draft board that, that just went and you were like, I wish I could have got him. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. (laughs) I mean, you only had so many selections, you know? I mean, so uh, there's a bunch of guys that were, that were out there that, uh, that we had up there that other teams took, uh, you know, that'd be, that's too hard for me to tell you, to be honest with you. I, I, I can understand, Coach. I really can. And I was looking at just the draft pool you guys were selecting from, nearly 600 players. You had to take 38 over two days, and then you or got to, or excuse me, you had to do 35 over two days, and then you got to take 10, basically in the matter of what was about three hours. So I do not envy you. Um, I also just wanted to add in here, Coach, uh, I'm excited to see just what you're able to do in the short amount of time, but it is a short amount of time. I believe 30 days to kick off yesterday uh, and you yeah. guys start training camp next week. What is going uh, to your training camp going to look like from an install perspective, from a, how you want to ramp up practice and get prepared for that first weekend of games? Yeah. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to, you know, we've, we've started installing with our players on zoom. Uh, we've been doing that since we started drafting day one uh, to the last supplemental, we added those guys in. And so we've been getting to know our players. They've been getting to know the playbook. 
Uh, now, there's only still so much you can do, you know, on a Zoom meeting. But uh, I, I've, I've, you know, I've told our guys when they come in and we step on the field on the 25th, I'm going to expect them to know the day one install. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to have to go over it with them again. These guys are professionals. You know, this is their job. So they're going to know it. You know, we're going to go out there and we're going to have a crisp practice. Uh, we're going to get to we, we've got to teach them how we want to practice because you got 45 guys. You got to stay healthy, you know, and you got to be fresh. And so we've got to get our work done. But at the same time, we've got to take care of each other. You know, we've got to hit enough. But at the same time, we've got to take care of each other. You know, so basically you're going to see three to four days of install from us is where you will probably put in 95 percent of the schemes offensively and defensively and special teams. You know, and so in those first four days, we're going to throw it all at them and then we'll come back after that and we'll start, you know, working on the individual things as much. See, this is fascinating for me to hear, particularly from you. And, and I was buttonholing Coach Sumlin about this, too, because this is going to be your first opportunity to be a professional head coach. And there's some things that you're learning, but there are also some things you don't have to deal with, right? You know how much time you get. You know that if you go over that time, it's okay. And you're basically trying to treat these guys a little bit differently than you might say an incoming freshman who early enrolled. What are some of the differences that you have made for yourself to try to better acclimate to being a professional football coach? One, RJ, just think about this. I'm used to, you know, on the offensive field, you got about 50 guys. On the defensive field, you got about 50 guys. You got two fields and you, you, you take up all the space and everybody's working, right? Now you're on one half of a field, basically, because that's all you need because you only got 45 for the total team. You know, so you got 21 guys on offense and 21 guys on defense is the way we have it set up. So you're not even too deep. So talking to a lot of NFL coaches that, uh, you know, and, and picking their brains on how you need to practice, you know, to be able to get what you need to done, guys learn what to do and still get better, you know, individually. Uh, that's been the, the, the greatest challenge for me at this point is learning how to do that. You know, and now as a staff, putting that together and then making it go work. Coach, I'm excited to see what this team looks like when you get to kick off on April 17th and go into this 10 week regular season. Hopefully you are playing for a championship at the end. But thank you so much for your time, coach, and good luck this season. Thank you so much and go breakers. Thanks for watching this video. And remember, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any other videos on the number one ranked show YouTube channel.